Hello, this is Rebecca Martinez at artscalifornia.net, and today I have the privilege to speak with two of the um, offspring of Elaine Rothwell, also known as Art by Rothwell. I have with me Sue Rothwell, uh -huh, <laughs> daughter, and Bart Rothwell, her son. <laughs> and we have a really exciting interview today because uh, with Chess, currently being all the rage with some of the movies um, such as Queen's Gambit that have raised people's awareness in chess. We are fortunate enough to catch a glimpse into Elaine's chess series of etchings. And, um, and Bart was played a big part of um, her inspiration for that series. And uh, Bart, um, I think you have a couple of good stories about how how they got started. Um, yeah, so the the whole chess series actually started somewhat by accident um, in the summer of 1973. Um, so if you rewind a year from there in the summer of 1972, that was the last time that chess was really big in the news and you know caught the attention of a lot of non-chess players. And that's because Bobby Fischer uh, became the first American to win the, the World Chess Championship um, in a very long time. I think since 1892 was the last time an American had won, um, and none has won since. So it was, you know, a big national deal. And that was when I was 12 years old, and my mom and I were sort of looking for pastimes to share together. We decided to try chess. And so we sort of taught each other to play, and it was something we did you know, almost every day for the next year. Um, and by the summer of 73, we would both decided that I was ready to try actually playing in a national rated tournament. And so she took me to a nearby tournament at the Palmason Winery, which is in Saratoga. It's now the Mountain Winery, still there. And um, she, like any good artist, brought along her, check, her sketch pad so that during the long hours that she had to wait around for me to play my games, she could sit around and you know, sketch things that she saw and sketch the players. And so she did a number of sketches of people playing chess. And one thing she noticed is a lot of the players would sit like this. And you, know, you can't necessarily see it here, but she noticed that when she sketched it, the outline of their head and the space between their arms sort of looked like a pawn. And so because she was so into, you know, puzzles and sort of putting things into the, the, her drawings that people wouldn't see at first, she decided to make that into an actual pawn. Um, and that was the genesis of her very first work, which was Pawn Pun. I, I believe Sue's going to talk a little more about that, and I have it here to show as well. And it's really the art technique that she used, and that's... A stipple drawing that you framed, yes. Bart? Wow. Yes. So this is actually the very first um, piece that she ever did in the uh, in the chess series. This is not an etching. This is just a drawing. And Sue. Wow. I didn't realize that you framed them. So uh, <laughs> she would do stipple drawings before these in the chess series. Then she did seven chess pieces or chess art with stipple, which is tiny, thousands of tiny little dots. <laughs> so yeah, she, and let me let me just zoom it in so you can see what she's talking about. You can see yeah. all the little tiny dots. All she did was, well, go ahead, Sue. <laughs> yeah, so that was her art form, was, was the stipple drawings. And she did seven of those, and they were all, from the summer of 73, they were all done by that fall, and when she had a show with them. Yes. And it's 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 nice, um, yes. Bart, that you have that original piece. That's great. So then, uh, so so what did she what did she do from there? Where did she go from there? Well, so um, she was very happy with Pon Pun, and we all thought it was really neat. And she thought, well, you know, let's expand it. And, and of course, you know, she and I were playing a lot of chess and talking about things she could do. And she wanted to do something a little more elaborate. Um, with more than just one piece. And so she came up with her next um, drawing, which is called Drawn Game. Yeah. And here you have eight different pieces on the board. Um, and the idea, it's it, again, it's kind of a 
pun in the title, Drawn Game, because it's something she drew. But also, if you notice, you've got a rook, a pawn, and a knight, and half here showing the black king, and the white king, also with a rook, pawn, and knight. And as a good chess player will know, if both players are down to those pieces, it typically ends in a draw. And they're both have their heads cupped in their hands, like concentrating, trying to figure out how to win. But in fact, it's going to be a draw. So this was an example where she added more pieces. But I remember telling her, it's like, but the pieces don't like attack each other or anything. And, you know, she thought maybe that was a little too much to, to try to do. But um, after some encouragement, she did her next piece, which is called Checkmate. And in this piece, the not only are there more pieces, but they also their positions are relevant. So here you can see the black king is represented by the crown here. You have a white queen, two rooks, and these knights are defending the queen, so it can't be captured. And in this um, chess position, the black king is actually in checkmate because the queen is attacking the king and the rooks are covering the two flanks so it can't escape. So this was a first example where she was actually using chess concepts, you know, having to do with position in the game. That's that's wonderful. What a good mm -hmm. story and a good sequence. So um, Sue, where did where did Elaine study? Where was she getting all of her her guidance on how to do these different techniques? Oh, well, I not sure what she learned the stipple, but she did after she created those first seven stipple chest drawings. Uh -huh. She went to the uh, Woodbury Graphic Studio and learned etching and printmaking. So she studied that for a couple years before she went on and made uh, her etching collection, beginning with uh, some things that weren't chess. But then she started redoing the, the same uh concept so pawn pun looks exactly like the other pawn pun but now it's an etching uh -huh. and when she first did the etching she did the same stipple technique she did it with uh what was it a a, a dissecting needle one little dot on her plate wow. when, you, when you do an etching you have to have a plate and she i think at the end she wasn't doing little dots <laughs> But I and I don't know if you can see on the plates whether they're dots because we don't have the plates anymore. Right? But she did uh, have a quote that she put out at that point about uh, her change and finding etching as the perfect medium for uh, doing chess. She said that that in chess, every in chess and in etchings, <laughs> every move is part of a strategy in which the reaction of the zinc plate, the acid, the ink, the dampness of the paper, and the pressure of the press must be predicted. So one small blunder and the game is lost, just as in chess. It's, so she, she was she really was, happy. Yes, yeah, she was brilliant, truly. She was quite brilliant. And so just to put things in context, mm -hmm. how old were you two when she was going to Woodbury college about well i was in high school okay well that right the, and i was already in college okay okay thank yeah, you i was that's already good. out of college yeah okay yeah. so that's how she was able to get squeeze the time in to do that <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah all the kids were pretty much self-sufficient by that uh -huh. <laughs> So she took it a little further, didn't she, Bart? Didn't she keep going with that? She did. Um, I, as I mentioned before, I somewhat naively assumed that, you know, she could just do anything she needed to. And I kept saying, you know, make a chess position, the whole position, you know, depict a game. And, and she always pushed back on that and tried to explain, you know, the difficulty in creating the foreground and just the right way to create pieces in the background. Um, but finally, after a lot of coaxing and, you know, thinking about ways to do it, um, in 1979, uh, she finally um, took, you know, a shot at it and decided to use um, as her game and position that she would depict uh, one of the most famous games ever played, um, 
which is known as the game of the century, which was played by the man who began the whole thing for us, Bobby Fischer, but when he was 13 years old. Wow. So at the age of 13, um, Bobby played against Donald Byrne in a chess tournament in New York. Uh, Donald Byrne was a well-known chess master at the time. And um, Bobby played um, a brilliant game. And um, I think we we're going to talk about the actual move that he made that made the game so famous a little bit later. But um, the, the game itself um, had been dubbed the game of the century by a chess journalist who was writing about the game afterwards. And uh, his quote was that uh, it was a stunning masterpiece of combination play performed by a boy of 13 against a formidable opponent that it matches the finest on record in the history of chess prodigies. Wow. That was, the game. That was what she chose to, to recreate in her first attempt at a, a full you know, 64 square chess etching. And then I was just going to say something about the game of the century that I've got a, it sort of showing back here a little bit. And, and it was done in Egyptian uh, tomb motif. So the players are uh, represented, well, the white pieces are King Akhenaten and Queen Nefertiti and their retinue. And then the white pieces are King Tutankhamen or King Tut and his court and his priest or bishop is about to make the memorable number 17 move uh, bishop to King three, which Bart's gonna now yeah. show you how it's represented on the piece. And if I could just add to that, those of you who are old enough to remember Steve Martin and King Tut, right. um, this was around <laughs> the time when you know, everybody was really into the Egyptian, you know, discoveries uh -huh. and, and King Tut. Um, so a lot of people have seen the, the, the etching, but they may not necessarily know exactly what's going on. The, the white pieces are represented on this side going this way, and that's Donald Burns' um, side, and Bobby was playing black going this way, and Donald Burns' bishop is right here, and it's attacking Bobby's queen. So normally Bobby would move the queen, but rather than do that, he let the queen um, just sit and moved his bishop back here, sacrificing his queen. And so Donald took the queen, um, which is normally you know, a game ending uh, move for the person who takes the queen. But what Bobby foresaw was that he could um, take this bishop and then a number of other pieces and the pieces he had left without his queen, he was able to coordinate um, and actually checkmate Donald Byrne after uh, 27 moves later. Oh, and just to wow. show how, how uh, respectful Donald was of what had just happened, normally you resign in chess when you see you're going to lose. And Donald actually played it all the way to checkmate, which normally might be a show of disrespect. But in this case, it was sort of an aesthetic choice. You know, let's play this down to show, you know, exactly what you had in mind. And so. It was, it was quite a brilliant play by Bobby. That's exciting. That's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. And she did a, such a beautiful job of incorporating chess with the, with the world of Egypt, you know, who would have, who would have thought to put those <laughs> together? Yeah. All, lots of combination oh. of a lot of different worlds. My mom would. <laughs> yes, she would. <laughs> she would. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. And so she, I think Elaine um, became a little, she achieved a bit of uh, notoriety at this point. And uh, I, when I have to say that the time that I knew Elaine, we knew each other at the, we were both members at the Auburn Art Gallery. I always admired her, um, her energy to publicize herself and to get the word out about her work. And I think she had an, some articles, some articles published in different chess magazines even. Didn't she write some stories and, and uh, well, she did. Up? I Pretty much her biggest achievement um, came when she um, sent some information to Chess Life and Review. Um, and so, uh, and there it is. Uh -huh. So <laughs> when, when my mom and I first started playing chess way back in 1972, we immediately signed up for their monthly publication. 
Um, and we were both kind of, you know, in awe of this, you know, magazine with all of these very famous players and analysis of these, you know, things we had no idea what they were talking about. And it seemed like just this, this level of, of professionalism way above anything that we would ever have anything to do with. Um, but when she did Game of the Century and it started to kind of catch on, a lot of chess players were really interested, you know, some of the very good chess players. And I, I'm not sure what exactly prompted her to reach out to Chess Life and Review, but she did. And um, not only were they interested, they actually wanted to do an entire feature article. And as Sue just showed, they put her on the cover of Chess Life and Review. And, you know, that was one of the most, I, I guess, um, fulfilling moments of her career. Yeah. You know, yeah. Something that to us had seemed, you know, way out of our league was now showing her art to the world of chess. And literally every serious chess player um, was reading that magazine. Yeah. So I, I think that was for her sort of one of those, one of those moments that shows you really made it in the world of art. Yeah. Yeah. Well, her, her work is very fine. And I know that um, we, you know, Sue and I, of course, have been working on the website for many years now and um, have shown her work in different, different places, different venues. And the chess series has always been one of the most popular um, series with collectors. And there are still some of the etchings are still available. And of course, those are showcased on her website, um, along with a little bit of a story about each each uh, piece where we have it. And I think um, behind on the wall behind you there, the black screens, a uh, blacks, yes. blues and greens. White and screens. White screens. <laughs> Say it again yeah. for me. <laughs> Say it again there for me, Sue. Yeah. Well, it's there any on, of, um, my mom. Yeah. There's mom again, right? Yeah. But yeah. On the back, yes. That's right. Yeah. Mom anyway. and dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mom and dad. Yeah. But behind you too, Bart, is Black's Blues on the left. This is where yes. she sort of decided to go outside of the chess game and just put the chess pieces in a different uh, format. In fact, if you uh, look at it on the, there'll be a larger version of. Eventually. Yeah, we'll, you we'll put it up on the screen. We'll put it on the screen. Yeah. yeah. But but there are actually musicians playing the blues. That's the idea. And uh -huh. in between them are the chess pieces. And then the other side, Bart moves over a little bit, is is white screens. And that actually was the first etching that she produced uh, of the chess series. And the green uh, was supposed to represent what she said was uh, the ever-present green and white roll-up chessboard. Mm. Uh, you used to have oh. roll-up chessboards. Well, they still do. That's how you know, still players in tournaments will roll out their board instead of having to carry something uh, bulky. But they're actually salad greens. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she was and, just and so I, clever. That was 1976. That's uh -huh. a long time ago. And she did <laughs> use um, very nice archival paper on all of her pieces. Everything yes. she did was according to the highest standards of, of printmaking. Um, her numbering system, her cataloging of who she sold the pieces to, everything was done just by the book. So she did a wonderful job of it. I didn't, and she didn't make enough of those. No, <laughs> Just that she many of them because they did yeah. sell out. Yeah, and, and of course the prices on the website uh, reflect that the ones that there are very few copies left of are are more expensive. Yeah. It, this one, for example, is number seventy five of seventy five. Uh, oh, you got so. that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I you don't. Know, I like think that. maybe we don't have any more of those, do we? No, we do. We do. Yeah. I think uh, there were some that may have had something that she thought was not right, but I look at them and I don't see anything. <laughs> so they're sort of artist right. proofs. They might be they're artist sort of proofs. Yeah. 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 But we also have the names of everybody who owns a print if someone wanted to sell theirs, which uh, has happened. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. And then awesome. just to say about the other chess full board positions. She did do several of those. Uh, 
where there's a ballet scene or a uh, yeah yeah Jete, right? yeah yeah you know, or other famous games so she only did 17 chess pieces though of all of her 196 pieces so uh-huh uh-huh. Well, I, I hope this um, piques the curiosity of our viewers to go to the website that's artbyrothwell.com and to take um, their time studying the, the various etchings, um, learn a little bit more about Elaine. And we're so lucky to have you two here uh, talking about the whole experience. Is there anything else you wanted to say? You know, it was it was a very memorable time for both of us. Um, I'll never forget, you yeah. know, chatting with her about you know the latest ideas she had, and it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's nice. Well, I thank you both. Mm -hmm. All right, signing well, off. Thank you. Thanks. For doing it. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.